All right. So today I want to talk a little bit about policy problems. Policy problems are things like environmental destruction, poverty, and war. Now, many of us turn to science and technology for the solutions to these problems, but we quickly realize that policy gets in the way. So let me give you an example. Let's say you want to do, create a sustainable city. Now, to create such a city, you'd have to train engineers how to redesign the land, water, energy, and information systems of the city. And to some extent, we do that. We teach them to design portable membrane filtration systems to purify water, but we don't teach them how to change economic policy to promote conservation. We teach them how to design renewable energy systems to reduce carbon, but not how to change energy policy to reduce fossil fuel subsidies. We teach them to design mass, at tran uh, mass transit systems to reduce energy, but not how to change zoning policy to make that viable. Now, we do train engineers how to design complex mechanical systems. So they know that if they modify the axle of a car, they're going to also have to modify the chassis. And we teach them how to communicate effectively in teams. But we don't teach them that if they want to make sustainable infrastructure, they might also have to change policy. So if you want widespread mass transit, you might also need a car tax. Even when we do teach engineers about policy, we don't teach them how to change it. And even if they did know how to change it, they couldn't change it alone. So we're really left with engineers who are at the mercy of policy problems, not ones that can solve them. So in short, good technology and bad policy means no impact. Now, in a democracy, you can't get good policy without engaged citizens, and that means civic education. So civic education raises a number of issues, so let me just address a few of them. So first, what civic education is not. First of all, we're not talking about the old civics, so boring textbooks on parliamentary procedure. We're talking about actively engaging students in the political process. Civic education is not about teaching students what the right policies are. So I might think sustainable cities are a good idea, but others might feel that the costs outweigh the benefits or that there's other more important democratic principles at stake. So civic education is not about indoctrinating students. It's about giving them the tools that they need to make well-informed decisions. And we can't shy away from teaching controversial issues because the alternative is apathy, and that's far, far worse. Next, civic education is not we're going to teach everyone to be rational and somehow end politics. The, the issue is that we have very disengaged, disorganized citizens and very organized private interests. And really, that shouldn't surprise us. I mean, if you didn't fund science education, we wouldn't have many scientists. So when we don't fund civic education, we don't get many uh, engaged citizens. But just as in, civic, in, in science education, if we can provide a general civic literacy for all and more advanced opportunities for some, we really can make a difference. So what is civic education? Well, it's generally agreed upon that it means creating citizens that are politically well-informed, can act politically and in the community, and possess civic and moral virtue. So if we want to change this equation, and civic education is the answer, what exactly does that involve? So what specifically would students need to learn? I, I think it involves three broad sets of abilities. So it involves teaching students how to be analysts, who can understand evidence and understand policy, advocates, or rather civic journalists who can educate and engage the public in policy problems, and activists who can work together with other citizens to demand a better policy. So how might educational technology, or uh, cyber learning as we're calling it now, help you teach students to become better informed citizens? So imagine for a second that you could give every student their own personal Aristotle. Now, that, we know this would be an extremely effective way to learn, but it would also be extremely expensive. We just don't have the resources to do that, or frankly, the philosophers, thank goodness. Um, but maybe we could do something like that with technology, specifically a kind of technology called intelligent tutoring. Now, if you haven't heard of this, but you've seen any science fiction in the last 30 years, you're already familiar with this idea. We've got games that teach and test, like an Ender's Game in the Diamond Age. We've got immersive learning environments, like in The Matrix and Star Trek. And of course, we have the educational robot, as in the Terminator. Now, I myself am not a big fan of educational robotics, because if pop culture teaches us anything, it's that you can never trust a robot. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, a real intelligent tutor isn't quite as exciting as what we see in the movies, but it's fortunately far less lethal. This is cognitive tutor algebra has been used by half a million students in the US. It looks a little bit like a textbook. Here the student's trying to solve a graphing problem. 
So they'll go step by step. They'll enter a maximum value for the y-axis there. Maybe it's 10, probably not a good answer. And then the tutor will immediately give them step level feedback on what they're doing. So you don't wait to the end of the problem to find out that you did something wrong. You're getting constant feedback just like you would from a human tutor. Now if the student doesn't understand what to do, they can ask for a hint. And then the tutor will give them some uh, principled feedback on uh, what they did wrong or what they should do right. And if they still don't understand, they can ask for more hints until the tutor finally gets them unstuck. <laughs> Now, how this works behind the scenes is that there's a small artificial intelligence program that knows all about solving algebra problems in many different ways. So when the tutor enters something into the program, the tutor thinks about all the ways it could solve the problem and sees if that matches what the student did. If the student did something that doesn't match all these different ways you could solve the problem, we know there's an issue, and the tutor provides feedback to the student. We know from a lot of research that this is good for learning, although we're still learning about how it affects motivation. Um, now, this is part of a larger kind of, of dream uh, called the two sigma problem. So the idea is that if you have uh, the majority of students, say, getting a C in a class, only 2% are getting an A level performance, whatever that means. The dream is that if you could give them all their own Aristotle, you could move a two sigma effect size. So you could move the students who are previously at a C to a level of learning that only 2% were at before. That's a two, seg two sigma effect size. So where are we today? Well, one thing we've learned is that human tutors aren't quite as good as we had hoped. So they're getting on average about a 0.79 effect size. Um, that's still amazing. If anyone working in education gets that kind of effect size, we're happy and we go home. Um, where are we now, though, after 30 or 40 years of intelligent tutoring research? Well, we're basically, at least in STEM domains, approximately at parity with a human tutor. Now, of course, if you look at particular tutors, depending on who you ask, where you measure, how you measure, you can get uh, even bigger gains. Just to give you another example, uh, Open Learning Initiative built a statistics tutor and online course, and they wanted to test it against a college professor. So when they did that, they found that they could get the same amount of learning as the college professor, which is not great for my job security. Um, but, but generally, we don't think this is the, the goal of, of tutoring systems. This is not considered best practice. What we prefer to do is take away the textbook, the lecture, all the static, non-interactive material, and have the tutor turn that into an interactive experience with feedback, and then that offloads a lot of the work for the teacher so they can use their time to do the things the computer can't do, the more complicated conceptual interactions with the students in a classroom. So that's called the blended approach. Now when you use the blended approach, when you combine the statistics professor with the computer tutor, you find that you can get the same, maybe slightly better learning games in half the time. So think about that for a minute. If you could do this for every college class, you could do your undergraduate degree in half the time and get the same amount of learning. Now, not only that, the, the teachers actually like it better because they don't have to do the boring stuff, and students like it better because they learn statistics in half the amount of time. So the only question in my mind is why everyone isn't working on this. Um, but there is, of course, a catch. And that's when you move outside the realm of mathematics and statistics, it becomes very difficult to build these kinds of systems, if not impossible. So what do we do about civics? So Policy World is our attempt to bring tutoring and games into the realm of teaching people to become well-informed citizens. It looks a little bit like this. So if you're familiar with Phoenix Wright, you'll recognize this theme. Um, you work for this character, who's your boss. She works, she runs a think tank. Uh, you have to make policy recommendations to a senator. And uh, along the way, you have to argue against a computer lobbyist. Um, you'll also have a senior uh, advisor who will help give you some policy problems and training, and of course, a computer tutor. Now, at the beginning of each level, uh, you search for information about a policy problem using this fake Google interface. So you come across uh, journalistic pieces, advocacy reports, um, uh, scientific reports, and so on. Um, and as you do that, the crux of the game focuses on teaching students how to make these causal diagrams of policy. So the causal diagram represents not only what the student thinks about the problem, but all the different pieces of information from all the different sources and how strong an evidence that provides. And our previous research shows that if you can teach students how to do this and use these diagrams, they become much better at solving policy problems. Now in order to motivate them to do this, 
they then have to debate against the computer. So the senator will ask them, what should we do about this policy issue? The student will pick one of their policy options, and then they have to justify how their intervention will affect the desired outcome. And as soon as they do that, the computer opponent will jump in and start attacking their causal mechanism, in this case saying that the cap and trade build won't actually decrease the amount of permitted carbon. So at that point, the student has to use the representation, the diagram they've created, to find the evidence that supports their position and cite that as evidence for why we should do their policy. Now if they do that well, they learn about the policy problem, they beat the opponent, and they move on to the next level. So our research is finding that with this tutoring and game-based approach, we can actually increase students' ability to reason about policy problems, and we can also design the game to both increase both the learning and the motivation at the same time. Okay, so that's becoming well-informed, but that's still not enough if you then can't engage other people in the policy problem. So how do we teach students how to communicate policy issues to a broader public? And in today's world of more democratized media, that means mastering new sets of digital literacies. Um, this is a project um, that I'm working on with uh, Ava Lam and Jack Doppelt in the Medill School of Journalism. It's called the Civic Media Immigrant Voices Project. This actually consists of three uh, interrelated class classes. So in the immigrant youth media class, we're teaching students in Chicago immigrant communities and the public schools how to do three-minute video profiles of how people in their community are affected by a policy issue like public health or income inequality. As the high school students are doing that, we have students in the Medill School of Journalism doing their own in-depth reporting on the same policy issue and also mentoring the high school students how to do community journalism. A new piece that's coming up now is the Digital Design for Social Change class in which undergraduate policy students are using programming and interactive media to take a really complex policy issue and explain it in an engaging uh, and educational way uh, to the high school students so that they can connect what they're seeing in the community with these broader policy issues. As that's happening, um, the plan next year is to then combine these different pieces of journalism, the video profiles, in-depth reports, interactive policy briefs together on the web and delivered through uh, mobile platforms. So it gives you just a little taste of how we might teach students to engage, in public pol the, engage the public in policy issues using digital media. Now, of course, um, teaching students how to become well-informed and how to engage others in policy issues is not enough unless it leads to action. So um, we don't have a perfect example of how to do that, but I think Design for America, a project started by Liz Gerbert Northwestern, uh, provides the template. So in Design for America, design and technology students from different majors work together with local community organizations to solve a social problem. So for instance, um, these undergraduate design teams have created products that help fight uh, hospital infections, that help children cope with diabetes, and to save millions of tons of wastewater from cafeterias. In only three years, this extracurricular undergraduate program has created two startups and spread to 15 universities across the nation. But I think more importantly, it shows the powerful untapped potential of engaging students by showing them how they can use their skills to solve a social need. So combined with analysis and advocacy, this would provide exactly the kind of civic education that we need to teach engineers and really all citizens how to solve policy problems. So we need to change this equation, and I think we can do it with civic education. We can teach engineers and all students how policy affects technology, to communicate these issues to a broader public, and to work together with other citizens demand, to demand better policy so that technology will actually have an impact. Now, if we want innovations like sustainable cities, then we need cyber civic education to create the engaged citizens who can create the technology and demand the policy to make an impact. Now, changes in the political system have made civic education absolutely imperative. Advances in educational technology like tutors, open educational resources, games, social media, now make it possible to meet such a formidable educational challenge. So cyber civics has the potential not only to increase the impact of science and technology, but to help us solve the greatest problems facing society. Thank you.